Hello and welcome to the weekly podcast of the Community Praise Center Alexandria, Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're glad you decided to join us today by downloading and listening to this week's featured message. We pray that you allow God to teach and inspire you while you listen. Delivering this week's message is Community Praise Center's Senior Pastor, Henry Wright. Amen. Amen. Thank you, dear young lady and Pastor Reed, for contributions to our worship. For the first service, my subject was deeper. For the second service, my subject is if. If. Let's pray. It is our prayer, Lord, that the subjunctive in our life will become the positive in our life. That the almost will become reality. That the not yet will actually take place for the good of our salvation. As we accept your leading into the theme deeper, may we see how possible that is only if. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The leadership team of CPC engages in a retreat every year. October and November, we assemble here on these grounds, or sometimes we will go off a ways, evaluate what has happened for the year, and anticipate God's leadership for the year to come. It is our custom. A part of that exercise is selecting these themes you hear. They don't just come up in some sudden burst of thought. They're usually discussed and hammered out and reviewed and discussed some more. And this year, for some reason, we had a more difficult time coming together, deciding this is it. We knew we wanted to do something with growth because... We had been affected by the results of a survey commissioned by the long-range planning committee of this congregation. And out of that survey came information that was disturbing to us. And so we knew, Harold Sanford having assessed the data, that something remarkably spiritually profound needed to happen at CPC. We are a church that on the surface looks quite strong. Church is full on Sabbaths. The funds come in at a good rate. Always can be more, but a good rate. Babies are being born. Most couples are staying together by hook or crook. Young folk are around. Many ministries are taking place, streaming all over the world. This is a, by appearances, good church. But the survey, it shook us, didn't it, Cheryl? Because in developing the survey, we decided, rather than just amassing data and facts about this, that, or the other, we decided to dig into CPC. And only because God has given you the grace of being honest did we see that what appears on the outside isn't necessarily what's going on on the inside. And only if we face this, we could discover that CPC is nothing but sounding brass and tinkling cymbals.
We shared the results of the survey with the elders, and they were moved with us that we needed to go forward and begin to share in an atmosphere of preaching and teaching, more teaching than preaching, the result of that survey, so that we could, at one hand, be thankful, April, for what God has done here at CPC, but on the other hand, recognize the fact that we can't go into the last days not really being what we say we are. Baptized, born again, members of the remnant church. And so, as we talked about growth, we kept talking about going up. And then old Reed, who just got through singing, this young fellow, young fellow on the staff, he kept pounding us with the one word, deeper. Old head pastor was resistant. Oh, we need more than one word. Pastor Reed, I've been around a number of years. They, they won't get it. Reed was relentless. And finally began to sway the team one by one. Bridges left me. <laughs> Smith left me. Deborah Carroll left me. Pastor hanging out there by himself. Oh, it needs to have to be a phrase. Reed was adamant. Deeper, deeper. So I said when I went down to preach for the Oakwood um, evangelism thing the first week of December, I said, look, I told, I told Waterman, you meet with them. We can't agree. You meet with them. I came back, they were all grinning at me. What's the theme? Deeper. <laughs> and that thing began to infiltrate the pastor's bone structure. Got into the core puzzles of my mind. And I began to say, you know, we're into something. Because if you can't go up unless you first go down. Everybody knows that. Deeper. Deeper. I want to approach the theme differently than I did for the first service. Go with me now to our key text, 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14. Did I pray? Did I? I'm old, y'all. I'm old. Did I pray? Did I pray? Bow your heads. Lord, bless this word, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Got to be safe. You can't pray too much. Can I get a witness? Yeah. See, you got a 70-year-old pastor, you know, the poor fella. He's just glad to be up. His teeth are working. Yeah. Can't preach the word without praying. Second, I love you much. Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. Now, read this with me. We know it. Now, some of you can quote it, but don't show off. Look down in your Bible and read God's word. Come on. Now, if my people, come on, everybody, if my people, huh? No, 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 no. What's the first word? If. If. It's a text in the subjunctive. It means that certain things will happen only if certain things happen. There's no guarantee here. What he says is going to result, only is going to result if my people do what? Well, let's read it. Which are called by my name, that's us, shall do what? humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That's loaded. Isn't that loaded? Yes. How are we going to do all that? How are we going to do all that? Humble, pray, seek, turn. That's a, that's a life full of stuff there. Would you say amen? amen? Then what will he do? Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Our text comes from a time, comes from a time in the history of Israel that precedes a golden era, the era of Solomon. It's the early reign of the young King Solomon when this takes place, when this text comes into being. His father David had a tumultuous yet successful kingship in military and political terms. The kingdoms of Judah and Israel had been united under David. The armies of David had carved out respect and prestige for the people of God. And even with the failed coup at David's, uh, at, at, near David's uh, death, when his own son Absalom tried to take the throne, still the kingdom, when David died, was strong and secure. Solomon, therefore, did not have to fight and conquer. This had been done by his father. His first commitment was to build a house 
of worship unto the Lord. Listen to me. He went about the task, focused, relentless, started in his fourth year, ended seven years later. He gave the task his best. You're listening to the pastor. Nothing was spared, but Solomon understood that the beauty of the kingdom would be the character of the people. That the beauty of the temple would be the character of the people who worship there, not the tapestries, not the precious metals, not the architecture, not the garments of the priest, not the nice praise teams, not the burgundy pews, not the white walls, not all the 80 ministries. The real strength would be the character of the people in the church. Did somebody say amen to that? And so Solomon sought the Lord. He wanted his approval and blessing on the building, her, but he said, look, I need more. I need to know that the people coming to church on Sabbath are already temples unto themselves. I've been saying it now for a number of years since I've been here, and I'm going to say it again without apology. The danger of religion is religion. Because religious activity, religious liturgy, religious stuff, religious doings, religious hymns, religious process has a way of, 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 of giving you a feeling that you're ready to go to heaven. But unfortunately... Unfortunately, God is not going to judge you on what you do here on Sabbath. It's the Sunday to Friday stuff that counts. I wish somebody would say amen. So, 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 what we do here on Sabbath is only meaningful if. It's only meaningful if. In chapter 5, the ark is brought to the temple. In chapter 6, in chapter 6 of 2 Chronicles, Solomon begins the dedication of the new church. Stay with me. By blessing the people and praying for them. And in that prayer, Solomon prays his famous prayer of ifs. I'll sum them up for you. Number one, if a person swears an oath to a neighbor, hear him, Lord. Number two, if the people of God are defeated by an enemy because they have sinned and then pray for forgiveness, hear them, Lord. Three, if the weather turns against God's people because they have sinned and cry out and confess, hear them, Lord. Number four, if there are pests and diseases and the people seek their God, hear them, Lord. Notice each of these blessings are preceded by the word. See, maybe there's a reason why Ellen White says we receive not because we ask not. See, if, uh, probably one of the most powerful words in the English language, by the way. Number five, even if people who are not of the household of Israel, have problems and have enough faith to seek the Lord at this temple, hear them, Lord. Six, if they go out to war and pray for help, hear them, Lord. And seven, if they just plain sin and are carried away captive and pray from their land of captivity, hear them, Lord. Solomon prays this public prayer based on the one word. What's the word? If, if. You see, Solomon understood. Listen, because I'm talking to you now. Solomon understood that our life is hooked together by decisions followed by consequences and blessings. And the little word if is the difference maker. I got a ticket going home the other night from prayer meeting, from prayer meeting. You get a ticket going home from prayer meeting. 
prayer meeting, y'all. Prayer meeting. The holiest service of the church, prayer meeting. And if only I had slowed down. And now be honest, don't sit there all pious like you never got a ticket. And notice, 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 notice. Usually when that happens, I do, you know, and, 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 and the guy was, you know, I, I tried everything. The guy was not nice. He was not nice. Maybe, I don't know, he had skunk for breakfast or something. He was not nice. And I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm using all my, you know, my, my, my baritone voice. Officer, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> he was hearing none of it. License, registration, please. And then I even tried to, I tried to get personal. I said, I'm sorry to cause you this inconvenience, officer. Yes. <laughs> Just like water off a duck's back. Now stay with me now. Driving home, I spend the rest of the trip home thinking about what word? If. If I had just, and the thing about it is, I was in cruise. See, I was in cruise. And I tried to explain to him that I was driving my big pickup. I said, when it goes up a hill, officer, it picks up. You came behind me before it eased back up. He was having none of that. And so I'm going home and I'm thinking, if. If, now you're smiling, but I guarantee you sitting here in this church right now, there's a big if hanging over your head. Amen. And we'll come back to some of those ifs in just a minute. Life is based on ifs. Let me go to the survey I referred to earlier. Because some of the revelations of that survey certainly speak to the power of the word if. Before I get to the survey and those facts that stirred your leadership team, and I want them to stir you, let me just give you some general dem demographics about this congregation that came out of the survey. And, and out of 1,100 people, we had almost 400 folks sign up. So that's a, uh, as surveys go, which are usually based on 5 or 6%, it's a wonderful survey. It's really a picture. It's a very, very valid picture of this congregation rooted in your honesty. But here's some of the things that came out. CPC, as we sit here today, is 68% female and 32% male. Now, that's a high percentage for a church. Uh, we are exceptionally blessed to have blood. Look around you. Look at all the men. Give the men a good amen. amen. Sitting in church. Most Adventist churches, it's 75 to 25 percent. We're 68, 32. We're a fairly young church. 83 percent of this congregation is under 60. That's why in order to have a seniors ministry here, we had to drop down to 50. And some of y'all still lying and hiding. Won't come to nothing. Fifty-two percent of the church, fifty-two percent of the church is under 45. Sixty-three percent are married. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a marrying church. 25% are single, the remainder to fall into divorced and widowed. Here was an interesting fact. 23%, almost one-fourth of the members of this church are the only Adventist in their home. Which lays upon that kind of person a tremendous witnessing responsibility. Could you say Amen. In other words, deeper, getting deeper, is not something you can sell with your mouth. If you're going to influence deepness, then you must be deep yourself. Does that make sense? So 25% are God's only witness to full truth. And of course, we all know, we all know, that some of the most difficult people in the world to win to the faith are what? Family. 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 Here was another interesting factor. 
68% of CPC members have been Adventists more than 20 years. See, what that produces, what that produces, Mara, what that produces is a kind of, a kind of uh, comfortableness. See, I've been an Adventist so long, number one, I have no non-Adventist friends. But more than that, I tend to think because I've been in the church so long, I'm ready to go in. Hey, 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 hey! That's not going to work. I know somebody called a thief on a cross who joined while dying. Come on, somebody. And the master said to him, this day I say to you, you've got a place. But I know some Pharisees and scribes who grew up in the church. So having a congregation that is almost 70% Adventist for the past 20 years is no guarantee that we are deep. It's only a guarantee that we are used to it. Thirty-two percent have been Adventists less than twenty years, and twenty-three percent have been Adventists less than fifteen years. That's the general demographics. Our goal this year is to challenge this talented multicultural congregation and those who worship with us online to go where we have never gone before. The theme is deeper. What is the theme? What is the theme? Turn to somebody now and say, I need to get deeper. We want that one word to become a drumbeat for CPC in 2012. Webster defines, watch me, watch me. Webster defines the word deeper 14 ways. I'm going to share just those that hit me that fit us. Being deeper means extending far down from the surface. To be deeper, you've got to get way below the surface. Number two, deeper means to be grave and serious. And folk, when it comes to salvation, hey, I believe in having a good time in church and enjoying the Lord and being full of joy. But the fact is, being saved is a serious business. Do you have sufficient balanced gravity about the issue of salvation? Uh, number three, being deeper means to be strongly felt, to, to have strong feelings about something. Uh, being deeper means to be intellectually profound. Being deeper means to be much involved. How many of these words describe your spiritual walk, your relationship to prayer, Bible study, personal worship? Do any of these definitions, far down deep, grave and serious, strongly felt, intellectually profound, much, in, much, in, um, uh, uh, much involved, do any of those definitions describe your relationship to Jesus? Well, if you probably said, yes, my response is, it still can be better. I said it still can be better. But only if. Only if. You know, one of the things I've enjoyed over my years of ministry is the fact that I've, I've, never, I've never been satisfied with where I am. Always learning. Always trying to do more. As you know, Cheryl, always pushing, pushing the team. We can do this. We can do that. We can do the other. Always visioning the next thing. Always growing. As long as life is in your body, you ought to be growing. Never allow yourself to be paralyzed with the disease of contentment. If you're a father, you can be a better father. If you're a good wife, you can be a better wife. Even the person who sings, the person who preaches, always seeking to be better. Painful as it is, I hate to hear myself preach. I hate it, but I listen. And pray that I can be better. It's painful. Listening to Henry Wright preach is painful. You sit there, you've been doing this thing for 47 years. Surely you ought to know better than to do that. But you do it. But then you get on your knees and say, Lord, 
Lord, you can help me be better. Aren't you glad to serve a God that's not easily satisfied? Come on, somebody. And, one of the, and some of the best people in your life, some of the most, some of the, God's gift to you are people who will not let you be satisfied. I know you don't like them. I know you don't like them. But if you've got a spouse or you've got a mother or a father or you've got a friend that pushes you forward, you ought to hug them every now and then. That was a very weak amen. Thank God for people who move me to excellence. What do you say? So what did we find about CPC that got us so stirred up? Slide number one. The survey asked the question, how many times do you have devotions during the week? Your honest answer was, 25% of you, one to two times. 21%, three to four times. 27%, five to six times. 28%, seven times or more. I guess they have devotions more than once a day. The name of seven days in the week. But go back to those first two. That's 46%. Almost half the church only has devotions one or two times, or three or four times a week. Almost half the church leaves the house and goes out into the streets of D.C., And didn't have devotion. Do you read the newspaper? Uh, we have a member in our church who went out to the gas station last week. And while they were pumping gas, somebody came in the other side of their car and took their purse and laptop. Now this is a praying person. We've reached the point in earth's history that the, to, to, to leave your house without devotions and hit the streets, you might as well take a gun and put it to your head. And we're not going to fuss at you this year. We're going to preach sermons that teach you how to have worship. See, what do you do? See, we're, we're not going to take anything for granted this year. I'm not even going to take for granted that you know how to read your Bible. So we're going to do sermons on how to read, how to ingest the Bible. We're, we're, we're going to do sermons on, on, on how to pray. Because, because we're finding out that some basic stuff is not going on. I'm going to say it again because you're having trouble with it. How can you leave your house in the morning and not talk to the one person who knows what's going to happen during that day? You've got to put it in his hands. What do you say out there? You've got to put it in his hands. You've got you to hand that thing to Jesus. So we were stirred by this. Almost 50%. Don't do personal devotions. Now don't sit there and beat yourself up. It can be better. Go on, turn to somebody right now and say it's going to be better. Yeah, don't just beat yourself up, sit there feeling all guilty in your face, all down. Maybe you didn't pray this morning. It's all right. It's all right. We got to rise above it. Because you see, here's the problem. Here's the problem. And the devil is so true. See, life, life it, 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 see, even your pastor, even your pastor. See, I'm wrapped up in religious stuff. So really, you can think you're stronger than you are. But there's, see, I, I can't just study the Bible preparing sermons for you. I got to spend some time studying for me. But devotion is relationship building. Devotion is relationship building. Devotion is relationship building. Devotion is getting close to God. Amen. 
So he can be one of those people about whom God can say, have you considered my servant Henry? And God knows when he pulls back the veil on me, I will not let him down. Why? I am filled with him. Comes in devotion. Well, we went deeper. Second slide. This was scary. How much time do you spend in prayer? Your answer was 12% only 15 minutes. This is per week. Now, that would be that would that would be weak. That would be that would that would not be good if this was per day. 15 to 30 minutes, 24%. 30 to 60 minutes, 30 percent. 60 to 90 minutes, 12 percent. 90 plus minutes, 21 percent. Let me tell you something about prayer. About prayer. See, prayer, prayer is not just kneeling down, folding your hands. I would tell the children, kneel by your head, I fold your hands. That's for kids. But adults have learned. You can pray while you're cooking. Hey! You can pray while you're driving. Somebody say amen out there. You can pray. You can pray while you're sitting at your desk. That's what I said. The Lord is practical. When he said pray without ceasing, he's no idiot. God knows. That's his way of saying, hey, look, you can be in contact with me all day long because we serve a God who's not limited by circumstances. Wherever you are, you can pray. So those statistics are sh shocking. Talk to him. Make him your buddy. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even when you're driving, just don't. You know, no, Lord, I'm getting ready, I'm ready to go into, I'm ready to go into Target now. Don't let me spend too much money. Yeah, just talk to him. Get him involved in your stuff. Now, Lord, I'm, I'm coming home, and, 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 and me, me and him argued this morning, and, 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 and I can go walk in, and he's going to have an attitude. Lord, help me not to have one. So you just pray, 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 pray. They're picking up the kids from school. Now, Lord, you know, I'm tired, and they're going to be back in the back seat fighting one another. Help me not to knock them out. See, pray. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Can I get a witness somewhere? Yes. Only 15 minutes? Man, you're lucky you haven't committed suicide. Because it takes prayer to give you a sane mind. Hey, hey, hey! We're not fussing. We're going to talk about prayer. We're going to talk about prayer. Claiming the promises of God. See, prayer, that's why the devil hates prayer, Cheryl, because he knows that's the one thing he can't stop a Christian from doing. In fact, I read, and I'm prepared for my sermon on prayer, I read, Ellen White says, that when a Christian bows and prays, Satan trembles. Because he knows you have a direct line to the power of the universe. That's what that slide showed. And of course, without that prayer, Sister B just said it, you don't have power. 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 Well, we went to another, another subject. Want to see some more slides? I don't care whether you do or not. Here it goes. Number three. I know you're bombed out right now. You're bombed out. You're sitting there saying, oh, Lord. Oh, we're going to be saved. We're going to be saved. Lift your chin. Lord loves us. Doesn't he love us? Yeah. He'll, 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 you know, if you've only been doing 15 minutes of prayer, look what he's getting out of the 15 minutes of prayer. You're still alive, ain't you? You can still see, can't you? See, you don't realize the devil spends every day of your life trying to take you out. Now look what the Lord is doing with you with 15 minutes of prayer. It's going you pray every day. Woo! I read somewhere in the Bible, Luke 6, verse 12, just hit my mind. That Jesus prayed all night. And that was the Savior. 
who did no wrong. Brother, praying all night. I'm sending it every day. Praying 20 minutes. Third slide. Third slide. Family worship. This is what you told us. How often does your family have worship each week? One to two times. 40%. That's most of us. Family worship. Man, my dad was something about that. Woo-wee. Moon. Dad. Worship. Wake up in the morning. Dad left for work at 6.30. He left at 6.30. I said he got out of the house at 6.30. So what time do you think we had worship? And he called, he called your name. No one on the really, really didn't. Boy. He did not call but one time. You don't want him to come back. How many of you know you don't want him to come back? Because <laughs> he's pulling the covers off. Not to bless you. There's going to be an event before worship. It was not negotiable. And see, some of us, we've made excuses for ourselves. See, you've got children in your house eating your food and spitting your electricity. And you're talking about what you can't make them do. I got problems with it. And I know I'm old time. I got problems with it. Wringing our hands like we children. I can't, I can't, I can't get them. I can't, you can't get them. What does that mean? What is that? What? See, you have, to, you have to define that to me, uh, uh, Corley. What does that mean? I can't get them. In the evening, he came in. He came in. He got home at four. At the same time that the Mickey Mouse Club came on. Well, no, I'm telling the truth about this thing now. By the time Dad got out of the car, got himself laid out, might be 4, 15, 4, 20. You know, they write in it, M-I-C-K-Y, click, click, click. It's time for worship. Pick that song up after we've had prayer. Family worship. Put the slide back up there. We're not done with that slide. Family worship. Family worship. Family come together and praying and talking to the Lord. Just you, pray. Just you and your child, pray. It's a blessing to come in at night and everybody get home safe. To wake up in the morning and everybody's awake. Nobody's dead. Come on, somebody. That's a blessing. Somebody dies every 10 seconds and you and your whole family woke up this morning and you did not pray. And thank God. That family worship might be, you know, this person, that room, that person, that room, worshiping, same time. I ain't trying to tell you how to do it, but we're going to make some suggestions. But we're talking about deeper. Now, we've talked about devotion. We've talked about prayer and family worship. You, you, see, you see what we're talking I want this congregation to be so... That the devil scared to death of CPC. We become God's juggernauts. We're going to get there. I said we're going to get there. We're going to get there. One more slide. One more slide. Oh, Lord. How often do you attend prayer meeting monthly? We'll just deal with the big number. 73% 73% don't. Now, I know right now you're getting very defensive. So like you get very defensive. You're sitting there and you're defensive. Well, my schedule don't want me to come. Pastor will understand that. Everybody can't come. I mean, just, just relax. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath right now. Just relax. Get the attitude off your shoulders. Well, he, he must not know how, what the traffic's like. 
You answered the survey. I didn't answer the survey. You answered the survey. You said you ain't going. <laughs> what you, that's what you put up there. Now, we're going to work with you. We're planning to develop prayer meeting online. So you can stay home. We'll still have it here for those who want to get up and come. My point simply is, folks, there's some... Ba- See, you thought the survey was going to show some profound... Deep stuff. Do you see where we're not deep? In simple stuff. Simple, basic stuff that's going to be the difference between somebody getting in the kingdom and not. We're not what we need to be, but I'll join her by the grace of God because information, information becomes inspiration. Can I get a witness out there? We're not going to fuss at you all year and beat you over the head. We got the facts. Now we're going to work together and see what God will do. Solomon got done praying. This text that we love to quote so much was God's response. It was God's response to all the ifs raised in Solomon's dedicatory prayer. He said, all right, Solomon, I heard you pray. Now, if my people (laughs) who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I (laughs) will hear from heaven and forgive their sin. And heal their land only if the power of decision is immeasurable. See, if only I'd never fooled with drugs, I wouldn't have these urges. If only I had stayed away from alcohol, I would not fight that battle on a daily basis. If only I had not gone out with that person, I wouldn't have STD. Or would not have been pregnant out of wedlock. If only I had gone to school and would not have fooled around while in school, I'd have that better job now. If. Why does our subjunctive always have to end in a negative? God takes it and says, look, if you just pray and seek my face, I'll turn your negative into a positive. Let me read you a text. Let me read you a text. Ezekiel 18. Go there, Ezekiel 18. It's one of my favorite texts in the Bible. Talk about a sweet if. Whoo! Hurry up. Hurry up. Don't hold me up. Ezekiel 18. Let's get to verse 20. Talk about the power of an if, young man. Watch this. You got it? 18, verse 20. Come on. The soul, that's a, not enough people reading. Come on. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Now, verse 21. Watch this, Melvin. This is good. But if the wicked, what's the, what's the key word? <laughs> ha! They got the sermon now, Moon. Read on. But if the wicked will do what? Turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. But that ain't ain't strong enough. Look at verse 22. Read. All. We've got to go back and read that again. Come on. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall... I don't need to read the rest of it. All. How many sins have you committed? He says, if, powerful word, just turn from it. Not only will I forgive you, but all that stuff you did, when your name comes up in judgment, it will not be discussed. How come you sitting there? How come you sitting there? All this stuff, it won't be made. Thank God that in the most critical moment in my life, what has been done will not be discussed. If only. God 
God is so powerful. Scratch that. God is so loving. You'll take a whole life of sin and then put an if behind it. And treat you on the basis of the next good thing that comes after the if. Did you all listen to that? See, what I like about the text is no, there's no, there's no any, 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 mo. He doesn't say, if you turn to me, I'll get rid of your worst sins. Number one, you really don't know what your worst sins are. They're not what you think they are. Some of the things that you think are not so bad are your worst sins. No, he says, I'm not going to do any, me, me, I'm not going to do any, me, 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 with your sins. I'm just going to get rid of all of it. Hey! Thank the Lord, Audra. All of it. If, if, if you will turn. God's behind your if. If you can decide to pray more, study more, worship deeply, God promises a positive response. And so some of our sermons this quarter, this quarter will focus on prayer, Bible study, worship, will seem juvenile. In fact, some sermons I'm going to preach this quarter, you're going to be insulted. You're going to say, he doesn't think we know anything. But that's all right. When people, who was it? Who was the famous coach? Green Bay Packers? Yeah, see, Sanford's one of the old guys. Sanford said Vince Lombardi. That's exactly what I'm talking about, Sanford. Yeah, the young bucks didn't know what he was talking about. Yeah, Vince Lombardi. He said the secret to being a championship football uh, team, he said just block better. Just block better. Just do the basics. Just do the basic stuff. Just do the basic. Picture yourself. Picture yourself being a Christian. That's just so full of God's love and relationship. You rise up in the morning a bit earlier. Hit your knees. And immediately you feel God's presence. Huh? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You feel His presence. Or, 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 your heart's so heavy, you really can't pray. But you go to your knees anyhow, and you feel God's presence. Hey! Because I read a text. It's in the Bible. It says that, it says that the Holy Spirit reads my heart, and with utterings and groanings I cannot, makes my request known to the Lord. Suppose you had a prayer life. Watch this one. Well, you get up in the morning and you say, your opening statement is, thank you, Lord, for the problems in my life. Because you come to accept the fact that God can do no wrong, so if the problem is there, if it's there, it's God's way of saving you. And by the way, the minute you thank God for a problem, it loses its control over you. See, that's the kind of prayer life we're talking about. We're going to get real this year. What do you say? We're going to get real this year. Thank you, Lord, for the cancer. Maybe more conscious of my health. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that the relationship broke up. Now I can go to the kingdom. Thank you, Lord, that I lost the job. They didn't say amen. Thank you, Lord, that I lost the job. I know you got a better one for me. It's hard for you to say amen right now. But you see, we're talking about a kind of deep depth with Jesus Christ that makes the relationship between you and him unbreakable and you become a frustration to the devil. And I don't know about you, but the devil has caused me enough frustration in my life. I think I owe him some frustration before I leave this life. Come on out there. He's nervous around me because he knows I'm close to the master and the maker. And when I walk, drop to my knees, 
he gets worried because he knows that when Henry Wright prays, because Henry Wright is so close to God, God does stuff. Daniel, are you all right? Yes, sir. I started praying. And the lions lost their taste for me. And the response was, I knew your God whom you serve. Our closing text, Isaiah 55 and verse 6. Isaiah 55 and verse 6. Read verses 6 and 7 together. Let us stand. Let us stand. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Will you assist me as we read? Seek ye the Lord, everybody. Seek ye the Lord, everybody. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. 7. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. If my people. You made a promise on that day. The people called by my name. Well, first of all, get off their high horse. Humble themselves. Secondly, refocus. Seek my face. Talk to me. Pray. Repent. Turn from their wicked ways. You said, I, the Lord, will hear from heaven. You said, you'll forgive our sins. You said, you would heal our land. Deeper. Lord, help us to go deeper. Well, Lord, I want to change that word from us to me. Help me go deeper. Would you pray that prayer out loud now? Help me go deeper. Say it again. Help me go deeper. Please be seated as the song of appeal is sung. Thank you for joining us for this week's message from Community Praise Center Alexandria, Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you have any questions about the message or would like to contact us with any prayer requests, please visit us at www.cpcsda.org and use the prayer request tool at the top of the page. We invite you to share this message with someone else and look forward to you joining us again next week. We pray that you experience the presence of God always with you.